The following is a man who has written one of the most intensely curious books. It is called Material World and looks at some of these raw ingredients that have shaped the world we live in. Namely, these materials are sand, salt, copper, oil, iron, and lithium. Nothing will give you a greater appreciation for globalization and the wondrous efficiency of global trade than this book will. It's a kind of miracle that things cost as cheaply as they do and are as ubiquitous as they are. I mean, countries were colonized just for spice and other cooking ingredients, but the fact that we now have billions of relatively poor people around the world rocking a smartphone in their pockets is a marvel and directly because of how remarkably humans have, over time, manipulated these six materials that Ed Conway writes about in this book. Some of you might remember episode 56 with Jos Benship. He's the VP of Science at ASML. This will serve nicely as a condiment to this episode, as will a super early episode, number 17, with Vince Beiser, who wrote an entire book about the wonder of sand. So this was a really cool episode to record. I got to sit down live with Ed in the Sky News studio in London. And again, I'm reminded how much I both prefer to record these in person, but as well think the final product is better off because of it. If you want to see some of the behind the scenes footage of that, go to my Instagram. It is the top link in the description. And of course, pump that good juice into the algorithm. And with no further ado, here is one of the United Kingdom's great economic communicators, Ed Conway. All right, Ed, how much of an appreciation for globalization did you get from this book? Wow. Um, I mean, so so I guess I started with like one view of, of, of how the world fitted together and you're kind of basing it off, I guess, what you hear in the media a lot of the time, you know, you're basing it off the, the moods of Donald Trump and Joe Biden and and things like Brexit and you get this impression, definitely the place where we are at the moment in the world, you get this impression that we are kind of rapidly deglobalizing and that, that people are reshoring, they're moving back production, you know, to their domestic areas. Um, but the funny thing is that having kind of gone on this on this journey, you are just completely taken aback by the fact that these interlinkages all around the world, and it's quite an inspiring story, the interlinkages all around the world when it comes to flows of materials, flows of goods, flows of commodities, the whole thing, are just so much greater than you appreciate, you know, whether it's whether it's metals, whether it's things like, you know, copper, going all around the world to be refined in one place, put into a wire somewhere else, you've got atoms of copper from one part of the world and another part of the world mingling together. Um, it's, it's quite a kind of, you know, exciting thing to just see all of these flows of, th- of, of of goods and for the time being at least you know there's been a lot of a lot of talk about reshoring and actually some of the the stuff i'm sure we can talk about this like the inflation reduction act and the chips act some of the the um the measures that we've seen recently in the us that that looks like it will bring some production home but the nature of globalization, the nature of this world that is so interlinked and where it is just a web uh, of different relationships, I was, I was, I was taken aback by how much deeper that was than I expected. You know, even as a as someone who covers this stuff on a daily basis, um, the amount of distance that a piece of silicon travels to go around the world before it becomes part of a silicon chip is crazy. Like it's crazy. It's much more than I had expected. And again the there's there's lots of cliches that i that i kind of found myself as part of this journey found myself um challenging like one of which is being that china is just utterly dominant in, in anything when it comes to making anything well it turns out that's that's not the case it's not the case for semiconductors it's not the case for even the silicon that goes into semiconductors it's not the case for for a lot of other materials as well and i i don't know if the conventional wisdom is very helpful on a lot of this stuff and that's i guess why i've gone into this for me unusual place of just trying to to look from the bottom up rather than the top down and and it's not that necessarily there's there's a grand new economic vision you can get out of that but i feel that you do get some some authenticity and some truth and some connection to 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 how the world works that i just didn't have before yeah and part of that is that globalization is a, it's, a, it's a still, it is the bedrock for how our world works. And if that, you know, if that comes to an end or if we have to, to reshore a lot of those, those activities, that 
two is is a far bigger deal than I think most people appreciate. A ridiculously big deal. It's a massively big deal, and I, and and you know, I think we can be. You know, politicians are gonna obviously give you easy answers, and we we've, we've had a lot of easy answers in the UK over the course of the last kind of five six years with with Brexit. A lot of people saying it's going to be fine, it's going to be easy. Well, it, you know, it turns out it's tough. Yeah. It's tough, and and you know, it may, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Any of these decisions, and that's the other problem is that on the one hand, with Brexit in particular, I don't want to make this this whole conversation about <laughs> Brexit because that's always the risk, but. You know, on the one hand, but it, it it is useful to talk about because it is an interesting experiment, isn't it? In right. in, in you know this new brave new world of countries kind of deglobalizing to some extent. Yeah. that's basically what pretending to be self reliant. Yeah, pretending to be self reliant, uh, insisting that that trade flows that they can influence trade flows that the gravity models that economists go on about don't necessarily matter. Well, they do, you know, and and actually Brexit started off being, in theory, a relatively minor kind of leaving a relatively minor dent depending on how you do it it turns out that the way that UK kind of the, the line the, the route the UK chose was the more dramatic kind of uh, breakage and or breakaway um, but also at the time in 2016 when Britain voted to leave I mean I was going to say it wasn't very obvious but like it was it was a bit obvious to some people but it wasn't obvious to the to you know most people that we would now be living, you know, in 2023 in this in this other world where there is lots of talk, at least, mm-hmm. about countries kind of d- returning into blocks and that era of untrammeled globalization potentially coming to an end. As I say, it's not it's not an end yet. We are still massively linked, and there's still a big open question mark as to how much of this stuff can come home. But you know, uh, it's it feels like it is a slightly different world now to to one that we were in 2016, mm-hmm. definitely. In the appreciation for globalization, was it that you were taken? You mentioned you were taken back several times just then. Were you taken back by how impressive the entire system is, how it works, or were you taken back by the fragility of it? Well, a bit of both. Yeah, I mean, it's I, it it goes back to that that uh, Leonard Reed essay, I I pencil. You pr- oh, yeah. Yeah, probably read it. The Terrific one. Anecdote. It's an amazing and 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 this this was like 1950s, and I'm sure yeah. you know many of your listeners will have come across it. I pencil uh, this essay, which is written from the point of view of the pencil. Mm-hmm. So it's saying I'm a pencil, and it just it goes through the various different stages it takes to make the pencil, all the way from you know the wood and where the wood is milled, what happens to it, you know it's slatted and and treated and so on. Uh, all the way through and the oil goes on it and the oil comes from somewhere else entirely and then you've got the eraser and you've got the lead, the graphite in there uh, and all of the different places all over the world that that comes from and it all kind of coalesces together to become a pencil and no single person knows right. how to make the pencil. Um, and you could basically take pretty much any product in the modern world, anything, especially electronics, and apply the same thing to it except it would be an even more marvellous world where no one actually understood the there was no architect you know there is no blind watchmaker or there is a blind watchmaker there's no there's no one who actually has the um the blueprint as to how to make all of this stuff Mm -hmm. including semiconductors which is the the one that i kind of spent a lot of time thinking about Mm -hmm. um and and it happens and yet it happens and that was the there were two kind of messages for when leonard reed was writing this essay in the 1950s one was um isn't this amazing no single person knows how to do this, but it just it just happens. And there is complexity in this world. And even simple things have marvelous stories about humankind turning simple substances into things that we can actually use every day. You know, we are still tool makers. We are still tool makers even now. But the second message was, um, given that there's no single person who knows how to how to do all of this stuff, central planning is basically doomed. And so at the time, that was the thing that Milton Friedman, for instance, who who um, really made this a famous essay, was keen to emphasize. But my I guess my revelation and I, I, I you know, I remember vividly the first time I read that and just being like, wow, wow, like that's how you make a pencil. It's that's that's so inspiring. What about the rest of the world? You know, what about <laughs> yeah. everything else? Yeah. Um, what about like paper, you know? And it turns out that it's a similarly complex supply chain for for all of these things. You know, even with paper, 
there there are enormous kind of stages of process that you need to get to between it being wood and pulp and then being paper and along the way you need chemicals and where do those chemicals come from well that's a whole separate story as well a lot of them by the way come from salt which is what, what one of the things that makes salt such a an unexpectedly fascinating substance that that is still a keep a bedrock of 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 the world today so i mean all of those things together are inspiring but there is to go back to your question there is a fragility in that in some cases because we have this increasingly you know we've lived in a world over the course of the past you know few decades where a, a lot because we are it is a big global market has been about price and about reducing the price as much as possible and being as efficient as possible and being as efficient as possible sometimes mean means you know stripping away some competition and the upshot is that in some cases we are very reliant on single sources whether it's the country for the most part but in some cases single places where we get stuff from and and that that's inherently fragile one of the, like one of the most striking things that places i've visited in the last few years is this plant um in cheshire in the uk so just kind of just uh, on the border of wales um, beautiful part of the world. This is where um, the majority of the UK salt comes from, and it, there's there's a long history going back to the kind of Victorian era where we we got our salt from there. And actually, for a long time, Cheshire salt they called it Liverpool salt because it was it was it was shipped via Liverpool. But Cheshire salt was was sold all over the world. You know, in Africa, they were obsessed with Cheshire salt. I mean, it's basically it's salt. It's not you know, it doesn't taste any different to salt anywhere else. But they had a kind of stranglehold over the over the entire global market. Well. One of the striking things, again, is that, and 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 by the way, the environmental conditions there were terrible. You know, the 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 place was shrouded in 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 kind of acrid coal smoke because you're burning a lot of coal to evaporate um, the the brine that comes out of the ground. Uh, you had areas that people had mined under the ground. Uh, there were collapses in some of the mines, so you've got these enormous indentations throughout throughout Cheshire, and they're still there, by the way. They're called flashes, little lakes that suddenly you kind of go over a hillock and you see this this strange lake that you know doesn't have any rivers going into it. Well, it turns out that's the result of a kind of flooded mine many years ago. It's a pool, um, and it's quite salty water because there's salt underneath. Um, Anyway, one of the most striking places I visited. Sorry, I, I've, got a, there's a habit, I've got a habit of going on tangents on this because there's, it, there's, there's so much. But one of the, one of the most fascinating and, and also, I guess, fragile places I, I visited is this plant where they are taking that brine, so they're still taking the salt out, and they are doing right now. Actually, in the UK, we are making about double, if not more, the amount of salt that we were back in that golden era right. when we were selling it all over the world. Um, but the vast majority of it goes not into the stuff that we sprinkle on our on our chips, but into chemicals. And this particular plant is taking brine. And it runs it through a, a lot of electrolyzers. It's an enormous kind of room where they've got one electrolyzer after another. And these electro, uh, electrolytic cells um, produce a few things. They produce hydrogen, but they also produce chlorine. And so you're kind of taking apart the uh, sodium chloride as well. And there's there's the and you can make bleach from it, and you can make you can get hydrogen from it. Uh, but the chlorine is really important because that chlorine that they make in that in that place um, purifies about ninety ninety five percent of all of the drinking water in this country. And it's one room. It's one room, right. and it's one room that m- the vast majority of the population are completely oblivious of. Yeah. And you feel kind of terrified there. And one of the people there said, if this place goes down, and by the way, you know, it is a very energy intensive place because you're running a lot of power into these cells to, to rip apart the, the, the brine, you know, the water the, uh, and salt that, that, that's, that's your kind of input. In fact, the amount of power that goes into that place is single room. The single room is more than powers the city of Liverpool. So the whole city of Liverpool for one particular, for one room. If that place went down, you know, if there's some catastrophic power cut, I mean, they've got lots of lines going in, so it's not going to happen, or something terrible happens, then we are rationing drinking water in this country within seven days or so. Right. You know, and- one place, one place. And and it's not like, and actually chlorine is quite difficult to ship because yeah. it's, it's quite kind of volatile. Okay. So it's not obvious how you deal with that very easily. Mm-hmm. You know, we'd find a way. And, and one of, I think, 
the lessons that I've learned. In but it's a massive inefficiency in the supply chain. Yeah, yeah. It, well, well, it's 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 a massive efficiency in that it's very you know it's very. I should say kind of, fragility. Yeah, but it's, it's a massive so hyper efficient. Exactly. You can't allow exactly. It I think that's the thing, and and um, the, that's one of, of of kind of many examples, um, which both. Well, it's interesting to understand where this stuff comes from, but it's also slightly worrying when you realise that that's it. You know, what 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 I guess I've tried to do um, in the course of the last few years of researching and then writing is try to understand what we're standing on. You know, yeah. what is the foundation? <laughs> what when you look down, yeah. you're not supposed to look down, but here we're looking down and we're seeing the stuff, the bedrock that we're standing on, and suddenly you're like, oh, hang on, okay, so that's it, so that's it, and and. Yeah, like I say, it's it's both um, exciting but but unsettling, and that's and it goes for so many of those substances yeah. as well. Uh, you did say in the introduction to the book a bit of a throwaway line, but I thought it summarized it really well. Just it's a book about the stuff we're running out of under the ground, um, <laughs> which is nice. Um, but before we look at a specific material. Uh, I just want to ask one more globalization broad related question because you have many of the cliche lessons of globalization, um, you know, the specialized labor, the removal of artisans, bringing the cost all the way down, hyper-efficiency, destruction of culture, all this sort of stuff. But I wonder in your research uh, whether there are any non-cliche lessons of globalization that you stumbled across. Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, hmm. I mean, so... So a lot of, well, I suppose there is still, there is still a, a kind of reliance that, that we can't kind of get away from on natural resources, like it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, where stuff, you're, you're, I think we think these days that we've transcended all of that stuff. Like it's we, all recycled or something. It's, yeah, it's it's all recyclable. That that if we run short of something, we'll just synthesize it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it doesn't really work that way. And like, even if you can synthesize certain things, often it's kind of much more expensive. I really like the only, the only really good example of us running out of something mineral and then synthesizing it is artificial fertilizer I, can't, I mean maybe there are others and I'd be interested if, if you know if your listeners can think of other examples but I haven't found anything else but that getting nitrogen from the air rather than from rocks turns out to be like a massive deal and that was a kind of great thing for everything else you still kind of need the stuff the basic stuff out of the ground and there your natural abundance or otherwise kind of matters. So China has tried for years and years, for decades, mm. to try and build its own iron ore in mining uh, sector. And they put they put so many billions of dollars into it and just haven't managed to do it because Australia is still, there is nowhere like the Pilbara. Yeah. You know, God created oh, it. That really. was such a cool chapter. It made me want to go there yeah. so much. Yeah, no, it's You it's, could just pick crazy. up a rock off the floor and it'd yeah. be heavier than a normal yeah. rock. Yeah, no, and then yeah. they are. They yeah. are when you kind of feel iron ore. It just, it's like, wow, that's... Uh, and also it's kind of, the rust comes off on your fingers on these rocks. So it's, it is rust literally on your fingers. But so I, I suppose it's that, that, you know, I don't know whether it's cliche or not cliche, but um, it's not just globalization. It's where the stuff is still matters. And I guess, you know, we'll, we'll talk about there are certain th things within these materials which just happen to be in certain countries. Yeah. Like random things like niobium, Basically, all of the world's niobium is in a few mines in Brazil. And, you know, you need that stuff if you're going to make certain types of steel. And no one, no one's that, you know, everyone's pretty relaxed about it because Brazil's relatively stable. You've never had any problems with these mines. But again, where stuff comes out of the ground matters. And our ability to turn it into other things is where globalization kind of, you know, that's where it, it begins and kind of leaps off from. And that's again the story of of human endeavor has been about creating massive supply chains across the world that that turn something simple into something complex and and that's and this is the other thing that i guess i hope comes across it's not just about having the most amazing gadget it's the fact that we can turn this stuff out on a mass you know we can mass produce it and that's it's like that's such a big deal, but it's often discounted. That's the great achievement of ASML. 
Right. right. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, ASML, but, but and TSMC, okay, because like, and uh, you know, ASML make these amazing machines, but it's interesting that even Intel can't make them work at scale or hasn't has struggled to thus far. And so it's that kind of combination of even having the best machines in the world, you still need to kind of apply them into a kind of mass production right. matrix. So are Intel also Samsung, using the EV well. machine? Yeah, yeah, they've got EV. But they can't well. Intel do it were one of the earliest, I don't know if you covered this in your ASML um, episode, but Intel were one of the earliest uh, investors. In fact, I think they put the most money into into EUV cool. early on. Um, but, and this is the great, this is the, the amazing thing. Actually, it's like we're still human beings with some tools and working out how to use those tools yeah turns out to be just as difficult as making the tool in the first place. I mean, you've got the sci-fi of what happens in the EUV machine. It's just mental. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. You, wouldn't, like, you wouldn't make it up, would you? Tell, just to highlight how mental it is, tell the anecdote of the drops of tin. Oh, I, See, I find that amazing. So, so you, in order to create, like, in order, okay, so let me, can I start? And, and Start with a plane of glass, actually. Well, well you know, but you know, you know, you know what's, you know what I find, like, amazing? Because yeah, I've seen probably, you know, you'll have seen all those pictures of the circuit boards that from right. that turned out to be from a few years ago, blown up a lot. And you're like, oh, look at all those little transistors. And you can see these tiny little grooves in them. And it's like, look at how small they are. That's amazing. But what I find kind of amazing is when you look at a modern microchip, you know, the thing that's in your iPhone, something with this kind of, you know, five nanometer length or seven nanometer length, that, you know, the size of the transistor is so small that even if you blew up that photograph as far as you could with anything optical, mm. you would still just see a flat surface because the wavelength of light is longer than the transistors. It's crazy. <laughs> it's Isn't that crazy? And so And humans managed to print that with accuracy. Yeah. We did that with with Incredible. with with kind of and that's the other thing interesting thing about semiconductors. I mean we shouldn't make the whole thing about semiconductors, but they are quite useful in but it, it's also the yield. So again, it's turning out kind of 90% reliable mm. chips rather than turning out kind of 50%. The, the, the success or otherwise of a semiconductor plant, it turns out, isn't just about making the, the, the smallest transistors. It's about kind of having the most kind of reliability and accuracy. But back to the, the tin. In order, so in order to make that thing that's so small that you can't even see it, you need a wavelength of light that is that is smaller, shorter than the, the normal wavelength of visible light, which is the extreme ultraviolet light, in an invisible form of light. Um, and obviously it's a fragile form of light and we have, basically there was a long period where no one was sure. They knew it existed in theory, but they didn't know how to generate it. It's not like you can buy a kind of LED <laughs> bulb. that, the, the that torch. Yeah, a torch, exactly. And so... Um, I, they went through, and I don't, I'm tr trying to think whether it was the 90s, but th and this is the thing that Intel put a lot of money into, working at how to produce it. And the way that they, uh, there must have been one of these crazy meetings where you've got a kind of scientist boffin character coming in and saying, okay, so what I'm thinking is, we're going we're gonna to take a drop of molten tin um, and we'll drop it inside a vacuum canister that's only got, I think, argon inside it. And we'll drop it and it'll be dropping, you know, kind of a breakneck speed. And as it's falling midway through the air, we're gonna smash it, not just once, but twice with two laser blasts from, it turns out, the world's most powerful laser, a kind of plasma, set of plasma lasers, which will kind of flatten it into a pancake and then vaporize it essentially. And it so happens when it gets vaporized, a bit of EUV light radiation, whatever you want to call it, this invisible light gets created. And then we need to find some way of collecting that light. Uh, and then only then can you kind of begin to bounce it off other lenses. And that is actually what happens inside these machines. Every, you know, it's, it's the, the, the tin is falling is the drops are small and the tin is falling so fast that you can't see it. And obviously you can't you know, see inside these things anyway, but it's falling so fast that you wouldn't be able to see it. But every, I don't know how many kind of microseconds it is, it is blasted with two uh, blasts of this incredible laser. Um, and then that creates this crazy light that we you know, have only just worked out how to actually do. And, and by the way, what I find kind of inspiring about this story, and I think it's inspiring, I think there are lessons not just for for the technology of kind of making computers and stuff, but also for things like climate change and the energy transition. There is so much that people say right now is too difficult to do. 
so much. EUV was one of those things. Everyone, or at least a lot of people, said they didn't think it was possible to achieve that, let alone to do it on a mass production basis, which is what's happening right now in Taiwan and South Korea. So anyway, the, the EUV light, the, this invisible light is radiation is created in this little kind of container. It then gets collected by these extraordinary lenses, which funnel it down a series of other mirrors. And eventually it ends up, and at this point, it's so incredibly small because of the optics that's going on here. And it comes back to the fact that the reason you're using light to do this is that conventional tools are just incapable, even, you know, atomic layer deposition are incapable of the kind of precision you get when you're using light and reflecting it down like a kind of the inversion of a movie camera. So it's starting with a with a big design, all of your all of your transistors. And, and incidentally, that the size of those, if you were to blow up those um, uh, circuit boards, the kind of the master boards that you're then kind of projecting down and etching onto chips if you were to blow them up i think the statistic was it would be like so that you could see the transistors i think it the this little master board itself would be the size of the the height of the burj khalifa in dubai like the it kind of boggles the mind but they are doing this and using this invisible light that no one thought we'd ever be able to create on a mass production basis every day of the week in South Korea and Taiwan, and as a result, turning out chips, all for just chips that are basically a little bit faster than the ones that came before them. That's the other amazing thing about Moore's Law. All for just, you know, slightly faster chips, and we still, you know, try to log on our phone and go a bit like, oh, it's a bit slow, why is it so slow? It is, you know, there's nanotechnology that's happening when you're trying to just swipe up your phone and open it. And uh, that, to me, is one of the wonders of the world. And it's one of the wonders of the world, not just... I think not just because of how amazing that that technology is, uh, but as I say, we've had amazing things in the past. You know, think of like people always think of Concorde, this supersonic jet, and they're like, why don't we have Concorde these days? We well, you know Concorde was obviously amazing in certain respects, but it was still it was only the 0.1 or 0.01 percent of the population would ever be able to travel on on Concorde. It was it was not something for the masses. These chips. Are the the absolute pi- the, the the bleeding edge the leading edge of technology and we all have them you know even even people in developing countries you know can have them in their Samsungs and you know they are they are just extraordinary and so I think that's something that is unappreciated because you know we we I think because we take a lot of this stuff for granted again because we'd probably spend a bit less time than we could thinking about, I'm sure not you, I'm sure not many of your listeners, but a lot of people don't think all that much about this stuff because they've been convinced for a long time that we're living in this ethereal world where physical stuff doesn't really matter anymore. If it's cheap and it's ubiquitous and you see everyone have it and you have multiple versions of the same phone, it kind of makes total sense why you would stop to appreciate actually what goes into it, where it comes from. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you know that's the wonder. Humans famously cannot conceptualize scale, right? Right, right. Yeah, and this is maybe another example of that. I suppose so. Yeah, but you know, you're totally right. It's ubiquity means we we kind of take it for granted. But I think it's it's the fact that we can take stuff for granted. That's what's amazing. Right. That's what's amazing. <laughs> but it but it just you know it, it it leads to complacency. And who are the people? If if the vast majority of the population, probably the vast majority of politicians, mm. are of that mind then who are the people who are going to kind of drive this forward, who are going to ensure that we can actually continue to to breed this success without taking for gr- taking it for granted? That's what I slightly wonder about. That you know, I wonder if that's why it's in places like kind of Taiwan, South Korea, where, you know, there, there has been more industrial strategy in the past um, that you find these places rather than you know, at Intel or for that matter here in the UK where we just don't have a semiconductor industry anymore. From your book, though, uh, something interesting I learned was how it was rather serendipitous that Taiwan ended up being the capital. And um, if you could explain why it was that all of these Chinese students happened to be studying X <laughs> yeah. in the US versus now, maybe they're doing yeah. software development. It's a thesis. I mean, it's a thesis, but it's one that I've heard actually from a couple of people within the semiconductor mm-hmm. industry. Um, and, and, could you explain that? And I love it, yeah. So, so basically... Uh, the thesis goes like this: When obviously Taiwan opened up and sent it was sending its students 
uh, over to the US and to Europe to, to study before China. And it so happened that at that point uh, that they sent those students out, out abroad. And the obvious example is someone like Morris Chang, who was the founder of TSMC, an extraordinary character. Found um, it in his 50s. Yeah, How found incredible. it in his 50s. And, 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 and you know, this is, a, this is a guy who can remember um, the communists coming to power. He can remember World War II, you know, being in, I think, Shanghai or Hong Kong during World War II. Um, and is still is still alive, and uh, yeah, is an is an extraordinary figure. But those kinds of people, okay, of that in that particular cohort, um, when they left Taiwan and they went to study abroad, um, it just so happened that that was the period when it was the early days of the Silicon, you know, revolution. And in those early days, the companies that that were kind of rising to the top were places like kind of Intel, Texas Instruments, Fairchild, you know, these the, all these companies which were making silicon chips. In some cases, you know, physically making it before the US had, had outsourced that to Asia. And so their education was somewhat more skewed towards physical computer engineering. You know, it was skewed towards actual hardware. Roll on a few decades and China is sending its... And those people, by the way, from Ty, from Taiwan would come back and they'd come back with expertise. And Morris Chang obviously is a kind of great example. You know, he worked in those early days at Texas Instruments. He understood how you actually get yield out of a semiconductor. And that's the point, is these boring things about getting the most yield you possibly can from a silicon wafer, the most chips that actually work. You know, he got that, he was really good at that um, at Texas Instruments. And roll on a few decades, China is sending its students to the US. And at that point, the companies in the ascendancy are places like Microsoft. It's services-based companies. And lo and behold, those students come back to China and they're not setting up semiconductor companies. They're setting up TikTok. They're setting up you know, Alibaba. They're setting up services companies. And you know, the extent to which that there's there's a direct line between those things, you know, I don't know. It's a great anecdote, and definitely people within the semiconductor industry talk about that. But it underlines that what you know what matters here, it, it, to a large extent when it comes to, to semiconductors, is is skill and expertise, and having a culture of manufacturing and making stuff. And um, the irony in China is that right now, you know, the government there, the authorities are desperate to do everything they can to create a semiconductor industry, but they've really struggled. Even before, it's worth saying, even before things like the Chips Act, even before the U.S sanctions on places like ASML, which say they can't send those extraordinary machines to China, which is really problematic because ASML is the only country in the company in the world that can make that stuff. But even before that, China was really struggling to, to create a semiconductor industry. And that's partly because you need you need the people who know how to do it. And most of those people these days, at least, uh, are in Taiwan and South Korea. And right now, you know, there was a story just the other day about someone who, who defected from South Korea to China um, to to try and run one of these semiconductor companies. And what I love about kind of taking the long view on these things, okay, that, that sounds about as modern as you could get. You know, it's China, it's South Korea, it's semiconductors, it's silicon. But actually, if you look back through history, that kind of thing has happened time and time again throughout history. I mean, so just, just to stay with silicon, um, the earliest kind of industrial subterfuge on silicon was all about glass, and it was all about the people who knew not just how, not how to make semiconductors, but how to make glass. Exactly the same thing. And for a long period, those people were, they were kind of smuggled from one country to another. And they were, they were asked not to leave. So you, the glassmakers of Murano in Venice, who made the, the first really, truly clear glass, they originally actually had come from, I think, Constantinople. But once they were in Murano, the, the authorities were like, well, you're not leaving. You're, we're not letting you out because glass is, is, is amazing. And it was, and it is. You know, glass glass at the time uh, was the most advanced technology in the world, comfortably, and in some ways, actually, it still is. And it was thanks to glass, you know, it is not for nothing, it's not coincidental, that things like the barometer and the thermometer and the discovery of, of, of kind of cult, getting kind of alcohol and um, various other, and actually, for that matter, the Renaissance, but that's another issue entirely. It is not for nothing that that stuff was happening around kind of Venice in Italy uh, at the very same time that this was the best place in the world for making glass. But, you know, back to those semiconductors, throughout the following centuries, you know, from the, the kind of 15th century onwards, 
you constantly had the British, the French, the Dutch trying to lure those technicians from Venice over to their countries to show them how to make glass in exactly the same way that China is trying to lure people from Taiwan and South Korea over to make semiconductors. So this stuff, tech transfer, industrial subterfuge, it is it has always been the way. And it's just that we're in a different chapter now with the technology still silicon technology but it's got a slightly different name and we think i think we think in our kind of quite modern way that it's all novel and that you know that that we are living in this kind of bold new age where where we're kind of reimagining the future well kind of not really we've got off there are echoes throughout and right, we have okay. our feet totally in the past as well as in the present mm. uh you could also make we'll make this the last um point on semiconductors because there's so much more well, to the yeah, book I as well <laughs> but um <laughs> thinking about uh, well at least drawing back into the opening point about the fragility and the hyper efficiency of globalization you could almost say that asml is uh a caricature or archetype of perfect globalization because you went to yeah. vleda herven i'm sure and saw that yeah. there is there is a software engineer from every corner of the planet, a hardware engineer from every corner of the planet. They're all working together. It's like, uh, it, it's it's not a Dutch place. You no, know, it's, it's an international place. It's international. And it also, I mean, that goes for the products themselves. So, you know, you, you look at the, whatever it's called, the twin scan NXC, the, the, the big machine, which is doing all that crazy stuff with, with um, extreme ultraviolet light. The, the machine itself is put together by ASML, but the parts that go inside it are from, I don't know whether it's hundreds or thousands, but so many different partners. And ASML think, you know, describe themselves as being this supply chain manager, really. Because yeah, yeah. while they, they make the machines and while they, they you know, it, the stuff inside. And that, again, is the, is the exciting thing. So it's a Dutch company, okay? And the world and technology as we know it is dependent on this single Dutch company which is crazy. Um, but the single Dutch company itself is also dependent completely on a German company to provide the lasers. Trumpf mm -hmm. provides the lasers. You know, that's, that's as I say, some of the most powerful lasers in the world. This place is the world leader in making these lasers. So that's, they're dependent on them. I mean, maybe you could find one or two better places, but there's, there's a quite a kind of limited number of places I'm where sure it can make those that. lasers. Same thing with lenses. So those amazing lenses that are collecting the enhanced ultraviolet light and indeed or extreme ultraviolet light and bouncing it off. Um, that's, that's actually another German company, Zeiss, mm -hmm. you know, which has a long history, which I go on about in the book, which is brilliant um, and fascinating. But that you need these other companies. So when you're looking at something like ASML, when you're looking at these machines that can can create nanotechnology, what you're seeing is this kind of is is an embodiment of globalization. You're seeing an embodiment of companies who are the very best at doing what they do, and in some cases have been doing it for decades, if not centuries, who are then putting their 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 kind of materials inside. And I find that again both exciting, but also, yeah, I get a little bit scary. But that's, you know, but it's the same thing for us. You know, if we're using, if you're using your phone, you're using, the, it's exactly the same thing. Apple doesn't make their phones, you know, they design them and they kind of engineer what they're going to look like, but they don't do any of the manufacturing themselves. They don't make any of the components inside themselves. It is all made by other companies. And putting these things together, and rather than coming up with a mongreloid thing that doesn't necessarily work, having an amazing end product, that is what ASML does, but it's what Apple does as well. And again, I've, that's inspiring because, wow, you know, that's, that's, they are able to take the best of everything mm -hmm. and put it into one single box. Um, and, and you say it's inspiring because of what you said earlier, thinking about climate change or maybe other giant existential issues. Potentially, technology could actually solve these issues. I think, yeah, I mean... EUV is a really good example because um, no one like no one thought that was possible. But you could go back, you know, a lot of people doubted whether you could make a solid state semiconductor, solid state switch. So the semiconductor in the first place, when it replaced you know, vacuum tubes, those valves, those glass valves, um, a lot of people were just skeptical that you were able to do it. Mm. So and, 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 you know, we lost the recipe for cement and concrete for more than a thousand years. And then we rediscovered it. 
no one thought for a long period that we would be able to to make soda ash. So soda ash is another one of those amazing, amazingly important chemicals that comes out of out of salt these days. But at the time, in I think the 18th century, a lot of people doubted that we would be able to get soda ash from salt. There was there was a grand one of those grand competitions organized by the French government. I don't know if it was the king or I think it was the king. It was just before the revolution. So it was Louis. And it was just before the revolution. And he laid down this challenge that, you know, can someone out there take salt and turn it into soda ash? And soda ash was massively important because, like I say, it's just one of those chemicals we use to convert one thing into another all around the world. So glass is a really good example. You can't make glass without soda ash because it's your flux that, that helps it to, helps the sand to melt because it's really got a high, high melting point sand. You know, at the time, a lot of people doubted that was going to be possible. And throughout history, people have done it. You know, they did it for sand, uh, for salt and soda ash. There's The story there is a rather sad one because the guy who did it, um, he's called Leblanc, um, he 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 came up with a discovery and basically by the time he came up so there was a big prize that the king had had offered and by the time he came up with the discovery the revolution had just hit the king was on the run he didn't get his prize money and then also because th there was just chaos throughout france uh, his factory was i think seized by the revolutionaries mm -hmm. they took his secrets on how to do it and i think basically sold it off abroad and eventually he died. I don't know if he killed himself or he, he died, you know, broken hearted a few years later. But it's rather, it's rather a sad story. But he still did it. You know, he managed to achieve this amazing thing. And subsequently, we've worked out a better way of doing it. But I think if we look back and we remind ourselves of at the time, there were always people who doubt that you can do it. And it's the most, you know, insurmountable thing. And it's always a few decades away. And in some cases, things do take a long time to develop. But look at EUV, look at salt and soda ash look at concrete look at all of these innovations that have happened over the last you know few centuries which which we need for our lives to stay alive how many things that we're now doubtful about you know whether it's it's fusion or or geothermal how many of these things that look like they're pretty insurmountable right now will we still in, in kind of half will our children or are their grandchildren feel exactly as complacent as we do right now about euv yeah. Probably, probably quite a few of them. It's it's a really nice, well, nice is such a bad word. It's an extremely optimistic uh, way of thinking about the future because it is way easier to cast doubt into something that's extremely difficult and doesn't have a precedence of having happened. Totally. But until it's happened, nothing's have a yeah, precedent of totally. being happened. And so, then it happens, and then, yeah, the, world's, and and then the world's changed. But often it kind of, it's like gradual. And the, and the world, you know, changes in a gradual, in an invisible way. Like yeah. no one. And then a few EV. generations later, they'll appreciate that moment when that person managed to do it. Yeah, yeah. well, hopefully. Yeah, or maybe Hope not. Or not. <laughs> maybe, that's, right. maybe, maybe that's the supreme achievement of humankind, mm. is that we can create this world that is comfortable and that where, where as many people as possible can, can be fed and be satisfied and, and live, live good lives without having to feel you know, enormous gratitude about it. Maybe that's it. I mean, li like it or not, because that's kind of where we are with a lot of this technology. We're no one very grateful for soda ash, but, you know, maybe we should be. An absolutely crazy statistic, um, which, again, every every point in this book just keeps reaffirming how incredible the systems are that we've built, but then also, like, how fragile the systems are as well. So, obviously, oil, I'm sure a lot of the audience realize that it's in almost everything. I'd like you to after this question say exactly the things that it's in because there are a lot of surprising things as well um but this statistic was completely insane we will have to produce more food in the next 40 years than all the food that has been produced in the last eight thousand. and this is compounded by scarcer water scarcer land and less nutrient dense soil that's that's how can that be? Uh, maybe uh, like explain why or how that could be the case. Well, I mean, that's it's kind of extrapolating population growth and and food demand and the fact you know there are one of the definitely I hope something that kind of comes across in the book is that is that we do consume an extraordinary amount of stuff and a lot of it's not especially necessary. We're terrible at conserving food. Terrible. Um, we're quite you know we're quite good at. Yeah, I didn't get that sense from the book, but I guess you're no. right. That is. Yeah, it should have been a massive takeaway. That could have just been my own bias. Well, I mean, it's it, <laughs> it's just you know being a hyper consumer. Well, I mean, it's, we we like we're 
there are good news stories, like certain things like steel, we're really good at, at recycling. Mm -hmm. um, other things less so. Steel's just like quite easy to recycle because most types of steel are magnetic. And it is like as pragmatic as that. It's basically you've got some scrap, you run it, you run it under a magnet, and the stuff that goes up you can recycle. But then the other stuff, you know, copper's trickier. Mm -hmm. You know, we only plastics I think it's, bad. plastics, you know, disastrous. And the issue with plastics is that you have so, and that's you know another oil product. Um, you have so many different varieties of plastics, and certain ones, you know, whether it's kind of thermo setting or not. That certain ones just can't go in the same pot when you recycle it and sorting it is just an utter nightmare so and and you know we've all seen it as consumers you've kind of got that plastic bottle and it's like is it's the number five symbol recycling and you're kind of like okay well i'll just put it in the recycling but then if it's going in there with something that's kind of a number one recycling then then what happens later it's one on? of the great griffs yeah. Let's be honest. It's one of the great Most groups. Even in Sweden, where they are so maniacal about their recycling, and everyone does it the right way, we recycle different colored plastics. Right, right okay. Yeah, and well, that's, a, that's important. Then a documentary comes out last year. It follows a Swedish documentary. It follows the supply chain of the recycled plastic. It's been shipped to Romania, and it's been burnt. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. nice job recycling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely disastrous, as you say. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, clearly recycling plastic is a great grift, yes. I would say. I, yeah, I, it, like it, it, it is, and and the difficulty is, yeah, it kind of tends to fall down with with the consumer, and that's and so back to food, you know, that's that's the issue there. We we we're, we're not especially good at conserving food, but by the same token, we haven't really had to be because we've been living, as I, I kind of said early on, abundance. enormous abundance for food, in large part. I mean, people talk about the green revolution, and and partly that was down to you know clever use of 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 um. Type, different types of wheat and Norman Borlaug and stuff. But I would say probably even more so it was down to the availability of artificial fertilizer. You know, we forget that artificial fertilizer, which itself is created from natural gas. So you use, you need to basically take hydrogen and react it with air and then you get the hy hydrogen and the nitrogen can kind of bond together in, in really high pressure um, circumstances again. That I should have added that as another thing that a lot of people thought would never be possible. Or right. there was a big challenge to um, towards the end of the nineteenth century. A lot of people were looking at how much um, mineral fertilizer we had because up until then, most of the fertilizer in the world was basically either it was kind of manure or like human feces, a lot of it, um, or kind of urine sometimes. Um, or it was mineral that you get out of the ground. But it so happened that the places that you get that out of the ground, it's not that many. So there was there was guano, like old bird droppings essentially, that had built up over many years on, a, on an island just off the coast of Peru, the Chincha Islands. Um, we, in the 19th century, we basically mined it all out. It went. And then we scattered it on the ground as fertilizer, and that was gone. Then they found there was lots of uh, something called caliche in the ground in, in the Atacama Desert, but again, we mined, we mined it out, and that, I, sorry I, I, for interrupting you here. Mm. But could that uh, the the presence of that natural fertilizer to mine could, d would that have any correlation with the great agricultural innovations of Latin of uh, South America? That's a really good question. Or, or is this too long of a boat? No, I mean it's a really good. I, like, I don't have a clue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, but, you know, it's a great thing to theorize yeah, about. Yeah. They they did what I do Give know. Me the answers all of I can tell you. History. <laughs> yeah, all I can tell you is that they were they for a long time the Incas you know were aware of how amazing this guano was, mm -hmm. and they to the extent that it was these these islands were considered holy islands and you weren't supposed to set foot on them unless you were kind of you know, had to do kind of various ceremonies, so and they used them to to sprinkle on the earth, mm -hmm. but yeah then we came along. Uh, we we the the West and discovered discovered them, uh, and we um, we plundered them. We took all of the and it was partly for partly for fertilizer, but actually it was just as much so it was for explosives. So nitrogen is is, is okay. nitrogen fertilizer, you know ammonia, it is it is an explosive as well. Um, it's kind of the bedrock of of, of TNT and stuff. So, um, but we then we then discovered we. The Fritz Haber and, and Karl Bosch in, in, in Germany discovered how to take nitrogen from the air and synthesize it into something that is a physical fertilizer. And the way that you do that, as I was saying, is you take hydrogen and you kind of it a pressure, heavily pressurized reactor. And one of the interesting ways in which all of these materials intertwine is like 
only at that point were you starting to get the really strong steels that you needed to make the reactor shells that you needed to try to do these reactions. Mm -hmm. So you see the way that the, these things intertwine. Mm -hmm. um, and then as a result of that, and it took a while for it to take off and started in Germany, obviously, uh, and Fritz Haber, incredibly controversial character. He was the first person to use chlorine gas yeah. uh, in World War One uh, to, to kind of create that as a, as a chemical weapon, um, but also created this technique, the Haber Bosch process, which we still use today, which has is responsible for basically feeding half the world's population. You know, even if you eat organically, there's a chance, there's a quite high likelihood that some of the nitrogen in your body. Yeah is created synthetically from the, the Harbour Bosch process, I would say very high likelihood, just because it gets everywhere. Um, and the upshot of that and the Green Revolution was that the extraordinary rise in global population that we've had over the last century or half century has been sustainable from a food perspective. I mean, you could talk about the carbon perspective and all of the other kind of perspectives but from a food perspective we didn't run out of food and a lot of people said we were going to run out of food we didn't and that is thanks to taking natural gas because these days harbor and bosch used coal and they got the hydrogen from the coal these days we use natural gas because that's just a more efficient clean way of doing it but it relies on taking natural gas running it through these pressurized converters you're turning it into hydrogen something called steam methane methane reforming happens along the way and then you make this amazing stuff, ammonia, that can feed the world. Um, and as a result, we haven't really had to kind of, you know, clearly there are still pockets of the world where you have famine. And But for the most part, this is not down to kind of crop availability. Sometimes it's drought, sometimes it's climate. More often than not, it's kind of political or, you know, it's warlords and it's what's going on with the politics of, of, of that of that nation. Generally speaking, it's not because of a, a shortage of, of fertilizer, and that's because we've gotten so good at making this stuff so cheaply. But then that brings you on to the, the kind of next challenge that we're facing as a, as a civilization, as a society, as a species, which is that, you know, we are trying to get to net zero. Mm -hmm. We're aware of the damage that carbon emissions have caused. This is a source of it. It's not massive, but it's a source of it. Mm -hmm. This is a fossil fuel product. Like it or not, food we eat is basically a fossil fuel product. It really is. How are we going to wrestle with that? How are we going to be kind of rational about that? I don't see much rationality within a lot of the way that the debate is is going on 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 climate. Um, I understand why it's a it's, it is an issue of great passion for a lot of people on both sides, frankly. Um, but we need to just be pragmatic and think about the the engineering challenges as well. And also appreciate what things like natural gas have actually brought us, which is to say, you know, f four billion people. I mean, yeah. although although again, there's two sides to that. There's lots of people who who feel like the world has too many people in it, and uh, part of the reason for that is is down to artificial fertilizers. That's a lot of the reason because they wouldn't have been supportable otherwise. So that's that's the difficulty. And and go back to your question. Those lines on food consumption you know keep keep going higher eventually there's a point where the global population will 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 peak and that's that's the interesting actually the most interesting story about demographics it's not about that which is what a lot of the lines that looked like they were doing recently but it's about the plateauing mm. the line going up and then plateauing uh, how do how do people project a plateau but, but, that's a good question i mean i yeah, yeah I, I i don't know but i but because like peter zihan obviously brought demographics into everyone's um what would you say just brought it yeah, to everyone's attention the, yeah. last year yeah and it's intensely fascinating you look at a lot of countries demographics like below replacement rate mm. and mm. then um in a lot of countries it's well above mm. and so you can see maybe how globally there mm. might be population increase but when you're talking about a rise and then a plateau, and the, I mean, it, yeah. it happens. Well, it does, but it, but it that's happens. it's happening in Japan. I mean, you look at it in Japan. You know, you've got yeah. shrinking population, and you you've got shrinking. Pop you will have shrinking populations in large parts of of Europe. I think soon. Sweden. Is it is that happening sure, already? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so I think Australia. So it literally is just that trajectory of the the the, the wealthier you are, the fewer children, generally speaking, you're having, and you kind of get below the replacement rate. You know, yeah. look at the UK; it's definitely the case here. Um, and then particularly if you're not having kind of immigration as much as you did before, and so that's so the the kind of bulge, um, 
we're still in the kind of upward tick of the bulge. But uh, and it's places like Pakistan, it's places like you know China's China's certainly kind of got poor, very poor demographics. Mm. Um, but places like you know Nigeria are going to be these enormous population centers in the future. And again, that's kind of interesting because these are places which need a lot more resources if they're going to get to the standard of living that we have in the West, mm. which means more steel, more concrete, more of everything, more copper. And that's before you consider the implications of, of climate change and net zero. Totally. Have more demand. And um, they're also going to consume the cheapest of those products that is available to them. Yeah. As would we if we were in the exact same position. Totally, yeah. And so, yeah. And why, and why shouldn't they? And why, and, why why should, they and why should we? And this is the difficulty I have with things like the kind of degrowth arguments. I understand totally why a lot of people feel we should consume less in, in, in developed economies. I mean, you know, we definitely buy too many cars. We get through our cars too quickly. I don't think we should have to have, have cars for, you know, it's obviously nice to buy a new car. But I don't think getting a car every kind of two or three years makes any pragmatic sense. It lasts a lot longer, frankly. Um, but so, yeah, we, we should do less consumption and kind, kind of we are at the moment. Um, but what about these nations where they just my, my favorite statistic, one of my favorite statistics from from the book is is like I, 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 I work in the world of economics and data. And and obviously, if you're talking to development experts, one of the things they look at is, is GDP per capita in different countries. And that's your benchmark for how well off or otherwise a country is. My favorite is, is not looking at GDP per capita, but looking at steel per capita. Okay. The stock of steel in your nation yeah. per capita. I just think it gives you this kind of sense. Because if you think about it, what what is steel? Well, steel is your car. And if you've got two cars, that's kind of a lot of steel. Mm -hmm. Steel is is the the office that you work in. Steel is the the structure, the the foundations of uh, of the city that you live in. Mm -hmm. It's that it's the the buildings, it's the houses, it's high speed it's rail, an it's roads. Of it's an indicator of development, exactly. It's bridges. You know, you need like lots of steel and the reinforced concrete there. And the amount of steel per capita in, in developed economies is about like 15 tons per person. So that's that is how much steel that you and I on average is that a fact? has. Yeah. So that's in our car. If you think about wow. the items of your life, you know, yeah. whether it's the school you're going to send your children to or yeah. like the, the home. And our fraction of that consumption. That's our, that's really? our personal fraction. That's it's about a great 15 statistic. tons. Yeah. Do you know what that is in Australia? I think it's a good question. I, I assume... I'm assuming higher. I, well, I don't Way know. Way more infrastructure for less people. Maybe. It's a really good question. I do have the data. I've got the data set somewhere, right. so I can, I, can, I can send it to you. So I assume it's similar, uh, maybe a bit higher. It kind of depends also. It's like all this random stuff, like if you tend to have a lot more hydroelectricity, you've got quite a lot more steel because there's lots of steel reinforcement bars within dams. And so it's... Uh, and if you've got a lot of high-speed rail, that's that's kind of quite a lot of steel. So there's all these. There's there's. I love that indicator. There's nuances, but so that's that's the rich world. Let's let's just say it's it's about 15 tons per person. Yeah. Um, in places like China, it's about seven eight tons per person. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's under one ton per mm -hmm. person. And if you are living in sub-Saharan Africa, of course you aspire to a world where you can have a car where you can have hospitals, of course you do, for heaven's sake, where you can have schools, you can have kind of, you know, concrete floors, uh, you can have a reliable infrastructure around you. Yeah. And so there's a lot of the world that still needs to catch up and get to that 15 tons per person. And we still, and who's to deny anyone? I mean, it's outrageous. But the only way we have of making steel cheaply right now, and cheaply, that's the key word there, is through pretty carbon intensive methods you take iron ore and you and you put it in a blast furnace this is virgin steel because we're talking about we need lots more steel within the world for for people the only way of doing that is really carbon intensive right now we still haven't cracked it, it it's hard to envisage how we can crack that quickly and so that's that's naughty like it's a naughty thing but on the flip side okay so that's the slightly scary thing that says you still need a hell of a lot of steel in the coming years and that's really carbon intensive and have we quite kind of appreciated that when we're calculating all of these ambitious goals probably not no. um but the, the optimistic thing i take from it is that our 15 tons per capita that you know you and i have mm. our, our delightful 15 tons of steel <laughs> um that's been pretty static for quite a while really? so there is i like 
some people will argue maybe that's just because certain economies are kind of deindustrializing. So, you know, in Germany, it looks like it's still kind of creeping up. You need lots of steel for, you know, for machines and things. But it does look like there is a point where you as a person have enough steel, you know, and, we, and we're pretty good at recycling it. In this country, we could s supply all of our steel from recycled mm -hmm. scrap, all of it. We don't at the moment. That's a whole other story about the weirdness of the British steel industry. We, 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 we burn a lot of coal. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but we could. We could, we could. There could be a point where we kind of reach enough. And that's kind of quite interesting, isn't it? Because like maybe if you're looking out into the future and wondering about our footprint, mm -hmm. then yeah, maybe there's something there. encouraging there. On like, the flip side, like encouraging be that it might cap yeah, the, at the, a certain stage, yeah, right? That we can get to a level where we're no longer having to get quite so much yeah. stuff out of the ground. On the flip side, uh, well, a a steel is is really easily recyclable because it's magnetic, so it's kind of a good example. B, there are so many other examples that of areas where just humankind, having been seemingly satisfied and got enough of the stuff it needs, then invents this other like right. product we all we all needed and exactly. never thought we needed. Yeah. And so as long as that happens, probably we'll we'll kind of want more stuff. But I mean there are there are definitely reasons for optimism. And I like I don't know where I stand on all this. I veer between being kind of pessimistic and optimistic. You like Nassim Taleb? What's that? Do you like Nassim Taleb? Nassim oh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Taleb. Yeah, sorry, yeah. He, I mean, he's he's an interesting character. I just say because <laughs> um, from one of his books, there's this line that you cannot predict a future of infinite possibilities based off a finite experience of the past. Yeah. And this is all in the couching context of being fooled by randomness and totally. again and again and again and again misrepresenting what the future is going to be. It turns out it's fine. Turns out it's different than what you thought. Turns out we're way more resilient than you thought. Anyway, yeah. it's just like. Um, I for this, buy that. for this, you know, for any talk about climate change, development, economics, I was just thinking about that. That yeah, it's nice to talk about, but the kind of maybe the truth is, I who might have said what the truth is, but maybe the truth is that it's just far too complex for any individual or even group of individuals to like predict, and therefore yeah. we just roll with it and react as we go along, and yeah. um, and 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 like, I mean. Ever since I was in high school, people have spoken about climate change um, pretty mm. pretty drastically. Mm. And I think it's good. It's good. Everyone talks about it. Everyone knows about it. Actually, yeah. I don't know some crazy... I don't know how crazy this is, but I was at a grade cricketer show on Monday night. It's a local uh, cricketer podcast, Australian guys. They they had enough... It's amazing. They had enough of an audience. They sold out an entire venue here. And, wow. And the guest was being... They're cackling about winning the first test in the Ashes. Yeah, but also, like, you know, the guest was making some pretty, like, uh, you know, edgy jokes. And it was really interesting to see the whole room, like, not laugh. And okay. Be quiet. And, and, and I just took it as a signal of the... Edgy about uh, what kind of thing? Uh, climate change, okay. you know, girls playing in guys' sports and stuff. Okay, yeah. But it was interesting because you would have thought mm. that this was the audience that's, who would be like, yeah. that's fucking hilarious. Yeah. But it was dead quiet. Anyway, I don't know why it just went to that, but thinking, I think, but things, I think it's, it is interesting. It's like, because the consensus has shifted, and and I think you know to some extent that's because you know there, there is more evidence now of you know anthropogenic climate change than than we had before. You know the evidence is is it's is hard to fight against that argument. Exactly, I, yeah. and, and I think and I think as a result, what's interesting, and this is kind of something that's that's kind of happened, I think, in the past kind of five years or so, is that. Now there's far more attention, I think it's a good thing, on like how we get there. It's like may, there, there is still, you know, there's still a legitimate argument about whether setting particular goals is sensible, whether 2050 makes sense or not. Germany spending 40 billion euros right. for a five-year projection to get to zero is is pissing down the drain. Right. So, that, so yeah, and, and like I think there's there's also issues... Like in the way that in the way that Europe, for instance, is kind of is doing it. So like in the US, the interesting thing about US policy right now is you've got things like the Inflation Reduction Act, which which are kind of, you know, that's a lot of money uh, going into kind of clean tech. Um, but then by the same token, you still have a lot of money going into fracking. And you still have the fact that the US is the world's biggest producer of of of, of oil and gas. You know, it's an extraordinary story, crazy story, unbelievable, world changing story, story yeah. which again does not get the attention it deserves. Um, you know that's part of the explanation for why the US economy 
you know, has has been and continued to to surprise people on the upside. You know, it has cheap energy, and you need cheap energy to to make stuff. But in the in Europe, it's it feels like as well as having the investment in clean, you know, tech, which actually there's probably more of than in the US if you just look at some of those numbers. As well as having that, there is an attempt to kind of like suppress any fossil fuel activity, which, while I can understand the political reasons behind it, seems odd given that we are still reliant on this stuff for so much of you know whether it's like the gas that goes into fertilizers, and this and, yeah or pharmaceuticals. And look at you know, as I say, one of the greatest achievements of humankind was the invention of the Harbour Bosch process. That was BASF. It was the, the company now is BASF. Um, BASF has literally stopped making fertilizer at its biggest plant in Ludwigshafen. They've literally stopped. They've stopped doing it, and they're now shipping it in from elsewhere. A lot of, a lot of. We don't, we don't make fertilizer in this country anymore. We had one of the early, the very first plants in the world making fertilizer, um, synthesizing the air, turning it into fertilizer. Extraordinary place. Um, Aldous Huxley, when he wrote Brave New World, he based it in part on this particular plant on the northeast coast. They've stopped making fertilizer there. They basically, you know, a lot of it's a lot of it might be shut down, and no one's entirely sure at the moment. And all of it's coming from America because America has cheap gas, and this stuff, like, it feels like a lot of the approach to this politically, and to some extent, you know, from a corporate perspective, hasn't necessarily been rooted in rationality. You know, it's been kind of rooted instead in in a kind of black and white view of the world of of, of heroes and villains. But the real world is far more complex and grey and interesting than that, isn't it? It's like that's that's so simplistic. Um, and like part of what I hope, like I have no idea if this is a completely futile exercise, because I'm not I'm not like a polemicist. I'm not writing this book to try and advocate for a particular course of action. I'm just trying to lay out this mm-hmm. stuff. One of my hopes is that maybe a few people will read it and think, okay, it turns out it is a bit more complicated than I thought. It turns out it is a bit more interesting than I thought. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that those black and white views that maybe I've been hearing a lot of about heroes and these people are the villains, maybe that was a little bit kind of premature because this is the world I inhabit and let's just think more about it. Ed, we've only got 20 more minutes. Um, Time flies, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, obviously can't get to everything, but that's a, that's that's okay. There are six materials <laughs> in the book. So um, was this the conversation we were supposed to be having kind of 10 minutes in? Yes, exactly. <laughs> but um, heroes and villains, a mm. couple of big figures who feature in the book, Gina Reinhardt and yeah. her old man, yeah, oh my yeah. God. Robert Friedland, the Copper King. Yeah. Um, Aliko Dangote, the Cement King of Nigeria. Okay. Yeah. Um, Talk about some of the personalities behind these metals, and hopefully that will also uh, yeah. help you talk about the maybe corruption of it. The and, yeah, yeah. These, I mean, I think what's striking when you when what what struck me looking at a lot of these uh, materials and companies and figures is that a lot of the time, because because there are quite some of this stuff is quite concentrated because there are kind of you know few. Uh, company a few people working in these in these sectors there is quite a big concentration of of activity and wealth with certain people i mean the story of uh, hancock the guy the guy who discovered gina reinhardt's father who discovered well whether he discovered it or not is, is one of those you know interesting kind of questions but he he is the guy who changed the australian story when it came to iron ore um and interestingly enough did very little, if any, of the mining himself. He just got like a kind of finder's fee. He got it's an amazing deal, mm. you know. He got a deal like a royalty deal on on every ton of. It's proper Wild West stuff. It's amazing. He was flying around. Yeah. He was flying around in the outback, uh, and the story. So the story goes, um, it was rain. It was a rainy day, and he kind of dropped down into one of the valleys as he was flying there in in the Pilbara, um, and saw the the red the red rock, and some of these some of these rocks. Are you know just incredibly beautiful banded ironstone formations, and he saw this, and supposedly then uh, said, "There's iron in these hills," and and he he had discovered, again question mark as to whether it was him who discovered it, but he had discovered the world's 
most amazing resource of, of iron ore still is today. I mean, that's the thing is um, China has tried and tried in the same way that it's tried with semiconductors to build a semiconductor industry. It has tried to build an iron, iron ore industry, but it's still reliant on China, on, on Australia. And um, even decades on, there's no getting away from that. The interesting thing, I mean, by the way, on Australia is just how it's how how it gets so much stuff out of the ground but it basically just all gets refined somewhere else which is to say china you know and like i just do wonder to myself it's this it's a fascinating kind of symbiotic relationship with with china they take the minerals whether it's lithium whether it's copper whether it's iron iron obviously being the biggest example there's a journalist called paul cleary i'm not sure if you're familiar with them australian journalist wrote a book called trillion dollar baby right highly recommend okay. it it is the story of how australia just pisses away our natural resource right. windfall right? compared to the Norwegian economy and how they did it. Well, yeah. I find that interesting. And I, 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 I assume, too, but I don't, tragic. is it? But I see, I know nothing about Australian politics, but I assume that someone knows what they're doing. <laughs> but no, that's Neither wrong. Neither do that's I. That's clearly, clearly the wrong <laughs> assumption. Um, yeah, because like thinking about our politics in, 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 in this country. But anyway, so so you got like Lang Hancock and various other other characters who, who crop up, you know, quite a lot in the in the book. Um, and what's striking is, what's striking yeah, is like you get these people and companies that you might not have heard of, whether it's the, you know, Concrete King or kind of Robert Freeland, who's, who's this amazing copper kind of prospector, miner character, uh, who's still going, you know, I think two, if not three of the world's biggest copper mines right now are ones that he discovered. And it's like, including one that's, Incredible. that including two of the biggest risers. So, like an amazing character yeah. who supposed who was supposedly also like at college with Steve Jobs doesn't isn't that the story yeah more than at college with uh were they flatmates or something or? no steve like discovered his hippie rebellion through robert right. friedland and it's oh, in walter nice. isaacson's biography it's an incredible okay. anecdote of steve walking into the room robert's having sex with somebody and robert just goes yeah just sit there and wait a minute and uh, steve buys something off him and robert goes and like has a cult like a freaking like a hippie commune right Blimey. which sort of and anyway it got to the point where later on when steve jobs was steve jobs uh he made a comment that uh like of course he's a gold miner i would never buy anything off him basically a charlatan <laughs> it's so incredible because then this same guy's ivan home mines and like you say two yeah. of the three biggest copper mines in the world yeah genuinely one of the most powerful people in the world yeah. and as well you mentioned where he, where his mines are in the drc yeah you don't just you don't just get one of the big mines in the drc drc mongolia i think he found the one in mongolia oyo tolgoi i think he found that one as well so yeah it's like and and actually what's interesting about that comparison so 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 him him and steve jobs you know, Fried Friedland, he kind of, he occupies what I guess I call like the material world. So you're getting stuff out of the ground, you're making stuff out of it. Whereas Jobs, what's interesting about what Apple became, not not initially, but what it later became is it became this kind of um, the the perfect example of outsourcing everything. So you're you're outsourcing your entire supply chain, and they they were kind of one of the early people to do that, and particularly with Tim Cook. So Tim Cook was the great manager of that outsourced supply chain, where everything is made somewhere else, like whether it's Foxconn, and you're managing the supply of, um, you know, batteries from Japan and uh, process memory chips from somewhere else. You're managing that supply chain, but you're not actually making any of it, uh, and that's what's kind of interesting about those two characters is those those worlds are obviously they interact enormously but they 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 feel like they're kind of very different philosophies on on you know on business and how the how the world works um and yeah still so he, uh, you know robert freeland he's still going isn't he and he's still he's still one of the most interesting characters in in this space and and copper copper is perhaps one of the most important metals mm -hmm you know, substances in, in all of our lives. We don't think about copper. I feel like copper is always underrated because it's always, you know, it's beneath the wire. You know, it's because it's, it's, <laughs> right. it's got sheathing around it. You very rarely see it except in like some classy kitchen with, you know, copper cookware. But but it's it's so important. And there's this, you should, you should kind of go onto YouTube and look for, there's a video of someone that has this kind of copper uh, slab, just like a slab of copper, and they drop... Uh, a rare earth magnet, so a really, really powerful magnet on it. Okay, it's just a kind of sp spherical thing, or rather, kind of round 
uh, slab. And the magnet falls down as, as you'd expect it to fall, so it falls fast. And then when it reaches the copper slab, it just suddenly hovers in midair before just dropping slowly. It's kind of like when you see one of um, the SpaceX rockets come into land. And it just, what that underlined to me when I watched it, and I've kind of watched it so many times and thought about it a lot. And also there's other things like you kind of, you know, put a kind of like a, a magnet, run a magnet through a kind of coil of copper. And again, it just doesn't, it's, it doesn't plop out. It kind of slowly falls. Mm. What that underlines is just the amazing properties of a, an element, sci-fi a straightforward stuff. metal. And it's, and it's sci-fi stuff. And that, that same reaction that you're seeing when the magnet is falling or not quite falling when it's just slowly resting is, you know, that's electromagnetism. You know, that's, that is the power the power, literally the power that that we're all reliant, that you're reliant on for you know listening to this, and that that powers our world. Electricity. You know, the people talk about these different industrial revolutions, and you know a lot of them talk about the electricity being the second industrial revolution. It was so massive then, you know, because you had a lot of factories that were still run on steam power, and it was a really inefficient way to run factories. And in a way, you know, we think about light switches, and obviously light light was one of the big kind of things. You went from having incredibly kind of low levels of lumens within your kind of candlelight or your kerosene bulb or whatever it was um, through to having amazing kind of cheap light. So that was amazing. But so too was just everything else. Suddenly you could have motors that were far more efficient, had far more traction. So you could break down more things. You could have bigger vehicles. You could just run an entire plant, you know, using power, invisible humming power rather than chugging power. And today, you know, like there's there's no one who's listening who won't kind of when they think about it, think about those different parts of their life that one way or another are reliant on electricity, which is to say copper, because in the end, almost all of it still begins apart from a solar panel, really, which has, by the way, a lot of copper. Almost all of the power that we're consuming right now still begins with some magnets turning around copper or copper, you know, copper turning around magnets. It's it is. The interaction of copper and magnets um, is the bedrock for our lives. It's another, sorry, I've been probably said everything's a bedrock of our lives. <laughs> Fertilizer, <laughs> copper, steel, concrete, they all are. It's the case, that's they the all are. That's yeah. the point, that's what I'm banging on about. But like, yeah, so so copper, and we need crazy amounts more of it if we're gonna kind of fulfill all our ambitions. Just very quickly, um, maybe talk about the Moore's Law for copper. I, that thought that was intensely oh, yeah. fascinating. No, I love that. So yeah, so obviously everyone's aware of what Moore's law is. The idea that that each you know couple of years really, uh, each iteration of semiconductor is is getting exponentially more more powerful. Or, or these days actually, it's less about power and more just about the dimensions being able to fit enough. It's transistor density, and the idea is that over time we've just become better and better and more efficient at, at making more complex chips. And everyone, I actually read this thing from, I think it was Bill Gates saying that, you know, when it comes to mining, I think he was saying there is no equivalent. But actually, it turns out there kind of is. It's just that we haven't been looking at it in the right way. Because when you look at the the price of copper in real terms, it's kind of been flattish or maybe gone up a little bit over, over time. And that reflects the fact that we have mined out the easy stuff. You know, over the years, we've gone from grades of five, six, seven, eight percent, you know, stuff where you could really see the copper in there uh, to stuff that is below one percent. Really, Stuff that would have been considered junk is now our, where we get our copper from these days. Um, and over time, the great... Like there have been so many cases, so many episodes since the 70s, the 60s, in fact, since the 1920s, where people have said, hang on, we're about to run out of this stuff. Mm. You know, we, we've all heard about it when it comes to oil. Peak oil was a big thing a few years ago. It, it's been the same thing with copper for quite a long time. So you had it. There was limits to growth. That book in the 1970s. Um, the, the beginning, in a, in a sense, that was the, you know Earth Day. That was the beginning of the environmental movement. Well, that book, um, influential as it certainly was, among the many predictions in there was that we were going to run out of copper by I think 2022. So that didn't happen. In fact, by 2022, the total reserves, so amount of copper in the ground that we know we can get out, that we've got mines around, it's going to be okay. We're going to get that stuff. Reserves, resources. There's that resources. By the way, is a, is a kind of a different thing. That's the total amount there probably is in in the earth, and there's 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 plenty of there's plenty of copper, albeit in quite low concentrations. Um, but the amount of reserves that we have 
the amount of stuff that we've proven that we can get out of the ground went up over that period, even though each year we were mining more and more out of the ground. So the miracle of the modern world is that we have got better and better and better and better each year at getting ever more copper out of ever less promising rock. And the the kind of Moore's law on this is when you look at the number of hours it takes to get a given amount of copper out of the ground, like a ton or whatever it might be. You know, and in Roman days, it was, I think it was days or weeks, or maybe even like getting on for years. I can't remember the statistic. It's there in the book. Um, but over time, that amount of, of time it takes us and the amount of, you know, human power it takes to get out of the ground has diminished and diminished and diminished and diminished. And it's one of the triumphs, I think, of of our species that we now get so much copper out of the ground for ever less input. And that that's a productivity miracle. Mm -hmm. It is a productivity miracle. It's just as much a miracle as Moore's Law, except that it's not as sexy and it's not as evident and no one thinks and talks about copper as much as I think they should. Um, but that's amazing. And we did it. We did it by having, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple, but also kind of interesting. How do we do it? We did it by having big trucks, you know? We did it by having uh, there were, the first revolution in this was things like I mentioned them a second ago, having electron uh, kind of electricity to power the big grinding mills, and then you could have bigger grinding mills to tear down the rock and turn it into kind of kind of granulated or powdered form. Then we did it through having bigger trucks. You know, you went from having trucks that could carry forty tons to carry four hundred tons. You know, those massive ones you've probably seen. Mm -hmm. You know, in those mining uh, sites. And they are crazy, like until you have been there to one of these mine sites, you just can't get the scale of it because these things look like a normal truck. No, I mean, it's not a normal truck. The, the wheels are like the size of a double-decker bus almost. They are crazily big. And within the big bucket at the back, they can carry enormous amounts. And the simple improvement in the amount of rock you can carry mm. and the scale of these refineries, which got bigger and bigger over the years, and our invention of new processes to you know use chemicals and so on to leach these minerals out has been has completely revolutionized the world we would not have had you know it, there's a question mark over whether china would have been able to develop and urbanize in the way that it has over the past kind of 20 30 years without those trucks mm. the trucks are part of the reason for why we have the world to you know we have today they helped us they helped to save um, kind of the global economy um, and so those kinds of things and it's a similar story by the way for like iron ore and for a lot of other mining are one of the most extraordinary things we have done as a species we never talk about them we certainly never glorify them and I can understand why because it's really dirty stuff it's yeah. grimy stuff mining and there are very big legitimate questions over the amount of pollution it causes certain and carbon emissions mm -hmm. And if you look at some of these places, like I went to the, the world's biggest man-made hole, uh, one of two, and uh, this is a place, a mine in Chile. It's like a canyon. You stare into the into it, and you're like, you feel vertigo on the side. It's like looking into wow. the Grand Canyon. It's crazy. And what's even more crazy than that is the tailings dam. So the tailings are, is the waste from the, from the mine. The size of the tailings dam, and bear in mind, actually, until a few decades ago, they would just chuck this stuff into the rivers and it would go down to the sea and it would lead to terrible kind of, you know, pollution, arsenic, or the whole the whole lot. Um, but the tailings dam they now st chuck that stuff into is so big. I think the total size of it is bigger than Manhattan. Just the waste from that one mine, one mine. And in order to satisfy the goals that we have for net zero, we need another three mines like that every year through to 2050 mm -hmm. which is extraordinary and i don't know how achievable it is and because who's to say the second third fourth order consequences of that ruins your net zero goal anyway that's that's that's, that's, that's the thing i mean like there are there are there are quite a lot of complexities that yeah. you only start to see when you kind of look from the bottom up which is which is what i try to do it makes it more interesting though yeah. but again also what if uh, someone some brilliant engineer scientist physicist team of them come together and figure out a much cleaner way yeah. to treat the mines it's well, like that's it. that could be the 
um, the Bosch process yeah, the Bosch, in a exactly. different way. That's, that's exactly it. There's all these it. possibilities. I, and I think that's more likely. That's the funny thing. So people look at, and there's a whole chapter on it, so I don't want to discount it because it's really interesting. Uh, people look at things like deep sea mining and they wonder whether that might be the future. Although, I mean, God, we know... We know the mess we've met left on the surface. Do we really want to inflict the same thing under the sea where there's just so much less less we know about it? I don't know. But again, we're all implicated in this because we need the copper, we need the cobalt, we need the nickel and the manganese yeah. and all of yeah. the other things. But while I can understand that's kind of a sexy, interesting thing, it's far more likely that we just get incrementally better in the same way that we had the bigger trucks and the better kind of chemical processes. We just get better at getting the stuff from above ground. You know, these days you don't need human beings in the trucks. I've seen mine sites where they're operating everything out of a room, all of these remote vehicles. It's terrifying. And, you know, do we just have more productivity gains that mean we get even better and all the the stuff we now think is junk rock becomes legitimate ore and that solves everything? Like, it's entirely possible and it probably will happen. And then it'll happen in 20 years' time. Everyone will be like, oh, isn't it great that that, you know, we never ran out of copper and we go... And no one, you know, people yeah. will take it for granted yeah. in just the same way they do today, which is fine. But uh, that's 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 the human, you know, that's the, that's the story of human ingenuity, and and long may it continue. Ed, mate, um, we didn't touch lithium. Uh, we barely touched salt, <laughs> barely oil. It's an unbelievable lithium. book. I, you know, thoroughly, highly recommend it, and I know <laughs> it's going to be right up the alley of the audience, which as well, um, you know, for me is a you know, big reason why I was so stoked to talk to you. Uh, we've got five minutes left. Let's see if we can squeeze in these three questions. I try to okay. ask every guest. So <laughs> okay, not material related. All right. First being, could you uh, talk about the role that serendipity has played in your life? I, okay. Well, like I, I never had a plan for my for my career. I never, frankly, when I went into, I knew I wanted to, to write and to, to communicate. Um, but I had no idea about what. And, you know, when I went to, when I became a journalist, I had no interest whatsoever in, in covering economics. I thought it was the most boring thing in the world. I didn't want to do economics. I didn't want to do finance. I had friends that did finance. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, offense. <laughs> no offense to me or to you. And, and it just so happened, actually, I don't know if it's serendipitous, but it just so happened that was the only job that was going. And I grudgingly, grudgingly took it. And within... You know, I, I had to do a hell of a lot of learning. I don't have an economics degree. I do, well, no, I do now. I have like a master's. I went to back to university later on. But for a long period, I didn't have any economics qualifications and found learning it and coming from a position of total ignorance and then understanding it myself was the best route to communicating it. Mm. And yeah, serendipitously, I found that it was it was the most fascinating thing. And it was, And it's also... I think I guess slightly kind of under underserved. I'm surprised, always surprised at because I guess a lot of people get intimidated by the topic of economics. Um, they they try to kind of keep away from it, but it's a shame because first of all, there's a richness there that is I think we don't talk about enough, and secondly, I think these closed shops, you know, it's a quite a sniffy place. You know, I remember going to bank kind of conferences, press conferences at the Bank of England, and being you get kind of sneered at a bit. Really? Yeah, definitely. As a journalist, as a journalist, or as an economic journalist. Well, as as like, as as a journalist, with certainly if you're kind of if people doubt your credentials, mm. and they doubt they don't they kind of wonder whether you have an economics degree, then you get kind of sneered at, and that's which is crazy. But that's and I think that's quite widespread within. And I'm sure you realised that. Uh, what does your economics degree even mean? Well, I mean, having having then later gone, you know, to, to Harvard to study this, I kind of thought that the ground, I felt the grounding I had in, you know, being an autodidact, self, self-taught, self mm-hmm. was actually more useful, certainly for the kind of economics I was doing, you know, I wouldn't say it was useful for kind of microeconomic analysis or modeling or anything like that. But it was it was more useful than having gone yeah. to, to university to do a degree and I studied with some of the greats, you know. But if you're not um, publishing economic theory, is it necessary to know all of the no. like dense microeconomics? No, well, I you think could just read a few Thomas Sal books and like Henry yeah. Hazlitt, and all well, of totally, a sudden, totally, totally, you know. And yeah, and you, exactly. You kind of look for the great communicators and the, and the kind of counterintuitive and the and and you know also the mainstream minds and just try and get the synthesis for it. But I think you know that, that that's the strange thing. We live, we inhabit a grey area. You know, journalists inhabit a grey area. 
we we are we are not experts necessarily but we do talk to people who are experts you know in the course of writing that book i spoke to so many people who knew what they were talking about because it's not really an economics book it's all sorts of different things and then you learn to you learn to synthesize and to communicate and ultimately what we're doing is just taking stuff that we think people also you know would might like to know about or ought to know about um and just telling it in as engaging a way yeah. as possible it's like it's straightforward it's just communication but I'm just always surprised at how uh, many undercommunicated areas there are. Like this whole, like this whole book could have been written, you know, years ago. It wasn't. I was like, why is that not being written? Why is people and and I don't know. Maybe it's just because there's no one else who's dull enough to kind of look at the random <laughs> dull stuff that I want to look at. But um, it's yeah. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I never I never had a plan. So I, everything. To me, or getting into TV as well, everything has been a bit of serendipity, to be honest with you. Amazing. Um, as is the, which is exactly the type of response I hope to elicit from that question. Right. Because, I mean, very rarely, you know, again, it's maybe I'm too biased, but then Sim Taleb quote, I mean, it's like you, your prediction of tomorrow is hinged upon a moment of randomness that, you know, what if uh, there was, um, whatever your main passion was for journalism job opening and you got it yeah you wouldn't have written this book almost certainly yeah because you'd be on a totally different trajectory well i would have been doing book reviews you know? and you know kind of like you know twiddling my thumbs a little bit and right okay think about i don't know derrida or some, some, <laughs> I, like yeah so thank god so it was that. a totally different yeah okay, no, totally, wow. totally that well. was this that was my other path amazing mate um really really fast so we can get them on the record yeah, sorry what is a country you are bullish on um Australia. <laughs> amazing. Please yeah, electro, tell me electro why. states. In, amazing. You know, we are living in a new kind of quest. There's a quest for natural resources. It just needs to work out. Uh, and also, you know, standard of living in Australia. If you look at standard of living in Australia versus the UK, like we're noticing this here. Here in this country, our standard of living is collapsing. In places like Australia in particular, it's going up. Um, so I think I'm, quite, I'm actually quite bullish on Australia. Uh, and it just needs to kind of do more of the value add stuff that's yeah. that's the thing it's the yeah. refining and the what are you going to make out of it just don't just you know provide rocks to the rest of the world what else are you going to provide as well i mean i know that's a massive simplification but you know it's part of it yeah i um i echo that sentiment completely i think sydney you would be hard pressed to argue that it's not the highest standard of living city in the world yeah and right even with the crazy cost of living it's still um you know, you're paying just as much there as you are here in London. Mm. <laughs> You'd yeah, rather be in Sydney than London. Is, yeah, <laughs> you know. it's expensive. Um, okay, cool. So Australia. Um, okay, we won't go down that tangent. Um, <laughs> but you'll have more to say about that than I do. Finally, Ed, if you could witness a conversation between any two people of history, dead or alive, so a podcast, who are you listening to? Oh, my God. No gosh. language barrier. Oh, my God. I wish you I wish you told me these beforehand because now I'm on the spot. Golly, um, mm, I mean I have so I have just been reading this. This is I mean like I yeah, I have no set response to this. I've just been reading this. The have you read the making of the atomic bomb? No. It's uh, it, it's um, it's the definitive book on. Um, uh, that the making of the atomic bomb. <laughs> so if you, so you know obviously there's that that movie that's coming out Oppenheimer. Yeah, yeah. That's based on a the kind of that. the biography of, of 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 Oppenheimer. But actually this book uh, by Richard Rhodes is extraordinary. It's one of the best things, one of the best things I've read. Um, and uh, it's like so. Have you read the Prize by Jürgen? So obviously it's it's like the Prize, but for nuclear, and awesome. it goes it goes through. I mean, the prize is so good, so good. Um, but this this kind of goes, it sweeps through history and it's so good. And I guess, so my, I am, that period was just mental. It was just extraordinary. And so if you, I guess I'd like to kind of listen to Niels Bohr and I don't know, maybe Rutherford. I know this is really obscure and it's got nothing, <laughs> it's like got nothing. Yeah, who's but Rutherford? Like, so Ernest Rutherford, like he, he, was, he was the first guy to split the atom. And then Niels Bohr was kind of building on that stuff. Mm. And they were just living in like 
no one knew at the time whether when they set off the atomic bomb or when they when they split the atom whether the world would end like they were they were literally taking physics and completely yeah. kind of turning it upside down and that's pretty crazy that to have crazy. to have that on your mm. on your mind um and yet so they and they but they really sounded like interesting guys and you know Niels Bohr was kind of lived in Denmark for a while during during World War Two and was kind of almost kind of hounded out um so they're pretty interesting they're pretty interesting characters but I mean that's just like I I'm afraid you know, if you asked the question another time, it would have been it would have been someone else. So, well, if I'm lucky enough, Ed, maybe one day we can do <laughs> okay. it again. All right, and then uh, yeah, you I'll can be have less a bit obscure. On <laughs> no, but I think that's a that's a terrific one. I mean, because yes. it it's relevant, it's very fascinating. The most yeah. common one we get is Jesus Buddha. I'm happy you didn't say that. Jesus Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Ed. I'll take them. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. It's been so good.